And I wanted to welcome you all to today's presentation. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague at Pro Bono Net, Miranda Migueli. Thank you so much, Jillian, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining. Special appreciation goes out uh, to my panelists. Uh, as Jillian mentioned, my name is Miranda Migueli, and I serve as the Partnerships Manager at Pro Bono Net. Um, so I'll be moderating today's discussion, and I'm very exciting excited to introduce uh, everyone you'll be hearing from. So I'm going to start with my colleague, Zizi Bandera. And Zizi joined the Immigration Advocates Network in 2015 and has extensive experience working for immigrant worker and LGBT rights. Their previous uh, experience includes working with the Coalition for Humane Immigration Rights of Los Angeles, Public Allies in Los Angeles, the, American, the ACLU of Southern California, Equal Quality California and the Trevor Project. Uh, we also have Takao Yamada, who is a Seattle-based attorney and entrepreneur. Um, among the many hats he wears, he is a co-founder of AirportLawyer.org, which was created in direct response to President Trump's original travel ban and continues to serve as a resource for both volunteer attorneys and individuals uh, potentially facing deportation. We also have Sergio Acubia, and he is the Director of External Relations at Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, and uh, his work focuses on improving access to justice and creating resources for legal aid's clients. Um, he's helped to implement Hawaii's court-based self-help centers, launched its self-help interactive forms project, and developed its self-help legal information videos. And last but not least, we have Anna Steele, who is the Director of Consulting at Just Tech, uh, where she works with legal service providers uh, to develop and implement strategic technologies that are in line with those organizations' needs. And she got her start in legal services technology as the technology coordinator at Legal Assistance of Western New York, where she managed a number of LSC TIG funded projects. So uh, as Jillian mentioned, today is the second of a two-part series on language access. And if you were unable to attend the first of the two-part series, we encourage you to check out the recording. Uh, the link to the recording is displayed on the uh, slide, and it's also available in the chat box. The webinar featured a great group of panelists, some I see listening in today, so I'm going to try and do a summary and highlights justice, and they'll keep me honest. Um, so they talked about uh, machine translation, which is basically automated text translation, so things like Google Translate, which many of us are familiar with, as well as translation memory, which is software um, basically that captures translation for shared and future use. Uh, the panel is covered various experience with both of these tools, but a general theme that emerged is that these tools both have strengths and drawbacks and are really used in the context of a broader translation process with some expert human review. Uh, we heard about examples of machine translation on its own, making um, material changes to the meaning of content. Uh, so this is an, is an example where um, human review is particularly important in the access to justice con context. And we also heard about uh, successful models of translation memory use by both volunteers and professional translators. And one of the lessons there is that the quality of the translations is really controlled by the strength of the initial translations done using the tool. Uh, so the part one series started off emphasizing that meaningful language access is the goal, and part of which means that translations should be understandable by the audience they are targeted for. And I really think this concept of meaningful language access will continue to be relevant and central uh, to today's presentation. So uh, as far as today's presentation goes, after my brief introduction, We'll hear from Anna, who will talk about readclearly.org and writesclearly.org, and more generally the rule of plain language as an initial step for this meaningful language access in the translation process. After that, 
uh, Sergio will cover his experience with LSE TIG funded uh, language access projects. Uh, Takao will then share about his experience with the rapid rollout of airportlawyer.org and special considerations with the translation of site content, including languages that use different alphabets, and the process um, for outreach to communities that uh, Airport Lawyer was targeting to assist. We'll then hear from Zizi, who is covering the redesign of emmy.org, which is a tool for immigrants to understand their legal options around naturalization and other issues and how confidence and building trust among its targeted users factored into that design process. Um, and we will end with some time for questions, but as Jillian and Sart mentioned, we welcome questions uh, between each speaker. So unless there's initial uh, comments or questions, I will turn things over to Anna. And again, thank you uh, for attending. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Anna Steele and I'm the Director of Consulting at Just Tech. Uh, thank you Marinda and Jillian and Sart for uh, having me here today. And um, so as Marinda mentioned, I got my start in legal aid at Legal Assistance of Western New York where I was very, very quickly uh, introduced to the importance of plain language in legal aid writing. Um, I was right out of undergrad, I was an AmeriCorps VISTA, I was really excited to kind of jump into uh, the advocacy space, uh, getting to talk with clients and getting to help them with their legal issues and, you know, I worked on my first, uh, my first letter that I had written for my client, again, applying everything that I had just learned uh, with my fresh new bachelor's degree in how to be a great writer and, you know, using big words and sounding really intelligent in your writing and I present that to my supervisor and they're like, what? You can't send this to, to your client, uh, you know, and so that was kind of my very <laughs> uh, expedited introduction to plain language and its importance in the legal aid space. And from then, um, I have definitely become an advocate, uh, for a huge advocate for plain language um, and really uh, encourage folks to take it into consideration. Uh, when they're developing written materials both for their website uh, to be given to their clients. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the development of some plain language tools uh, while at Law New York, um, which I'll talk about today. Hopefully many of you have heard of them, and um, this is just a refresh, I hope, and if not, uh, welcome to those who are starting your plain language journey, and um, look forward to discussing some of these things with you today. So plain language, um, right, so here we have an example of before and after from our good friends over at Transcend Translations. And plain language not only is a language access issue, but it's also an access to justice issue. Um, if we are not going to be writing our legal information materials or correspondence with clients um, in a way that is readable, uh, we might as well be presenting it to them in a language that they do not speak. Um, you know, there's all sorts of information out there on what the average reading level is. Um, and, you know, we hear that that's often around 7th or 8th grade. And um, that number, that, that grade level really changes uh, when we're talking about low-income people and people who have not had um, as much experience in the education system as others. So plain language isn't just, you know, very carefully editing your work, right? It's by no means dumbing down your writing. It's really taking a proactive approach uh, to the development of your writing, really getting to know your audience, writing to that audience, um, and developing documentation in a way that is really understandable. So you, when approaching a document, you want to make sure that your audience can understand it the first time around. Um, you know, when people are looking for legal information, they're often in crisis. Uh, they often, um, you know, are trying to gather what information they can uh, between, uh, between getting off of work and getting uh, home to their families or between two different jobs um, or, or after hours, right? And they're trying to get the uh, best handle on their legal problems that they can. 
right? We all know that we, we can't provide an attorney to every person who walks through our door. So the better uh, written materials or the better our online materials are, um, the better off our client population is. And, you know, we're really not going to be able to achieve our goal of 100% access um, without really taking plain language into account. And so plain language is, you know, its own hour training, its own all day training, right? So I'm not going to get too, too much into the nitty gritty here, um, but just some of the highlights, right? There's obviously a writing component to plain language, a grammar component to plain language, right? Things like avoiding the passive voice, right? Things like keeping sentences short, um, using uh, more basic words, right? Avoiding words with too many syllables that are too complex, right? Really avoiding legalese, avoiding those words like wherefore um, that are so common in our legal writing. And, you know, beyond the words on the page itself, uh, there's really kind of a visual and uh, a visual component to sign language as well, right? You'll notice from this example from Transcend that the uh, the plain language example is much clearer, much easier to follow, um, not only in the language it's used, but the way that it's displayed on the page. So there are a number of tools out there that can help you um, while on your plain language journey. Um, two of these are Write Clearly and Read Clearly, um, and these are the two that I'm going to discuss today. The one thing that I do want to point out, those of you who do all of your work in Microsoft Office, um, there is the ability to test the readability of your information, or of your writing, um, using built-in tools in Microsoft Word and also in Outlook for your emails. Uh, you can turn that on in your settings, and um, it appears at the end of your spelling and grammar check. So there's a little readability score there that can help you kind of keep track of things. So, uh, write clearly. Um, this is this project goes way back and has seen many many iterations, um, all of which were TIG funded. Um, we worked with a number of partners throughout uh, the process, uh, mainly Transcend Translations and uh, the folks over at the Open Advocate team over at Urban Insight. And um, right, we'll start with Write Clearly here. And what it is is a, it's a, a plain language authoring tool that allows you to check your web content for plain language. And um, it's very easy to use. You just go to openadvocate.org slash write clearly. And you can click and drag uh, this blue button here. You can just click and drag that right up to your bookmark bar. And um, it will be able to run on websites. So it's free to use. And it's very easy to use. It, is, it can be used in any browser. And once it's up in your bookmark bar, you can navigate a, a page and check it for readability. Um, so here is one quick example that I have. Uh, this is from an article on bankruptcy. We've clicked the, the Write Clearly button and it gives us our Flesh Kincaid grade level, which in this instance is 5.94, so sixth grade, so we're looking pretty good. Um, it gives us a brief summary on what we can do to make that uh, document um, more readable potentially, right? So we've got shortening long sentences, replacing complex words, using gender-neutral gender language, um, avoiding too many underlines, and it will take you step-by-step step throughout the, uh, the, webs the, the content on the website and show you sentence-by-sentence sentence, uh, what you can do to improve that. So we have a couple of examples here. Um, this first one, right, it's telling us that we should use gender-neutral language. Um, so not only is that something as a community we should be trying to do in our writing in general, but it's also a, a plain language decision to make, right? It can be, um, it can overly complicate sentences and can and can take a, and can take away from some of the the meaning of the sentence or can confuse the reader about who the subject of the sentence is. Um, and also, when you're writing in plain language, you want to be, again, you want to be addressing your audience. Um, so you want to be uh, saying you whenever possible and, and making sure that you're directly addressing them. Uh, the second one here we have uh, telling us to replace some complex words or phrases, right? So in this example, it, it highlighted in order to. 
and um, it says to just replace that with the word too. Uh, so it gives you the ability to see some of the words um, that are problematic and also gives you suggestions for words that you may want to use instead. Um, the third example that I have here is just telling us to shorten this sentence. Um, right, let's see, one, two, three. It's, they say that sentences should be um, around 20 words or, or less, right? So that's something that you really want to think about. You don't want to have uh, complex sentences and um, you want to really avoid having too many clauses in a sentence when you're looking at your plain language work. So the second piece that I wanted to talk about was read clearly. Read, like write clearly, read clearly has had a number of different iterations. Um, read clearly is a plain language glossary for websites. Again, it's free, uh, very easy to use, also available on Open Advocate's website. And for uh, those of you who have Open Advocate websites uh, for your programs, you can um, just click a button to turn on Read Clearly on your website. Uh, otherwise, you can install it the same way you would install um, something like Google Analytics, right? So really kind of easy snippet to put into your, your website code. And so while on New York, I worked alongside um, Maria Midland and, and her team at Transcend Translations to work on these uh, different glossaries. And what this does is the glossary will look at your web content. Uh, words will be uh, highlighted that are in the glossary, and it will give a plain language definition of that word. Um, and like I said, we've had many different iterations of the glossary, uh, refining it over time, expanding and refining it over time. And um, we're really, really happy with the direction that it's going in. And one thing that we've been really excited about, which kind of also plays into the conversation of, of these past, this webinar and the, the preceding one, um, is, is the language access issue component of this. And uh, we added the ability for certain words in the glossary, certain English words in the glossary to have Spanish definitions, right? So someone um, may be able to read uh, English to an extent, but uh, they may find it easier to have more complicated words explained in their native language. So here's an example of that, um, where we defined mortgage in Spanish uh, to give a, someone who's a native Spanish speaker a better idea of um, of what a mortgage is, right? Because that's something um, uh, someone who's not a native English speaker uh, might not understand, or they might know what it is, but to have the definition in their native language makes a lot more sense. And then the next component of this is a full Spanish glossary, right? So we also have a, a small a full Spanish glossary for folks that have Spanish mirror sites or content that is all in Spanish. Um, and it does the same thing. It gives a uh, definition to uh, the words that we select. And this has been a really interesting process. Um, we've learned a lot. And I think one of the important things that, to consider going forward is, you know, when we first, our first adaptation of this and, and using Spanish as part of these uh, glossaries, was to just take the words that we were defining in English and define them in Spanish. But what's important is that we kind of think through that a little bit more, right? Because a complex word in Spanish may not be a complex word in English. An easy word in Spanish, or excuse me, in English may have a, a more complex word in, in Spanish, something we wouldn't normally define in English, we would want to define in Spanish. Um, so I think as this project continues to evolve, that's definitely something that we want to, to be thinking about is making sure that um, you know, we're not just directly translating the glossary necessarily from English to Spanish, but really thinking through how we can make it more beneficial um, for folks uh, who speak other languages. And one of our biggest requests around Read Clearly has been to be able to create custom glossaries. And you can do that now. Um, you, we keep all of our Read Clearly glossaries on GitHub. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with GitHub, uh, there's a, a couple really good uh, LS and TAP webinars on how to use it. Um, and so what you can do is you can uh, go go to our GitHub, GitHub repo and you can find these glossaries and you can uh, download them and edit them and make them their own. If, if you want to spin up a whole new language, you can. 
Um, and, you know, then there's a vetting process for these glossaries, and then they can be made available uh, to the, the Read Clearly community as a whole, uh, which is really exciting because I know that, you know, different jurisdictions, different states have different, uh, you know, words may, may be used slightly differently. There may be, uh, you know, places that want to create glossaries that are specific to a certain area of law or, again, a specific language. Um, so I definitely encourage folks who are interested in uh, using Read Clearly uh, to consider what they would need to do or if it's necessary and what they would need to do to create, um, to create their own glossaries. As I said, this is, uh, both of these projects um, are ongoing and evolving, um, so definitely interested to hear feedback from folks who are using it. Um, and uh, I really strongly encourage all of you um, to think about plain language in your content development. And um, happy to answer any questions now or uh, at the end of the webinar, or feel free to reach out if you have any questions as well. Thank you, Anna. I think we'll pause now for questions before we turn things over to Sergio. I am not seeing any questions at this time. Just definitely want to reiterate, though, how amazing Read Clearly and Write Clearly are as resources. Just super valuable. I use them with all of my uh, new staff because really untraining that those bad habits from law school is so important for helping clients. Thanks, Art. So now we'll hear from uh, Sergio. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, oops, let me go back a slide. Um, all right, I think I'm all set here. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Miranda, and uh, for everyone for having me as part of uh, uh, this panel this morning. Um, so I'm really, if, as uh, I'm coming from the perspective or experience of uh, from an LSC organization. You know, for some of you that are on the call, you know, you understand we have uh, limited resources. So for us, we rely a lot on, the, on TIG funding, we rely a lot on uh, creativity, and, you know, finally, we rely on uh, what we, some best practices that we get from some of the conferences that we attend, the ITC conference, um, you know, learning from what other organizations are doing, uh, especially what Anna was doing <clears throat> when she was uh, with the Legal Aid Organization in New York. Um, so I'll be talking more on that perspective. Um, with Hawaii, we're a little bit unique in that uh, I know some other states probably face similar issues that, issues as well, but 25% uh, of our population, oops, I'm going to go back, 25% of our population, uh, having a little bit of trouble here, okay. okay. So with 25% of our population we speak a language other than English at home, there's at least 130 languages are spoken. Um, in the state, the top three uh, spoken languages are Tagalog, Ilocano. Uh, those are Filipino languages and uh, Japanese. But according to the Hawaii State Judiciary, the highest demand for interpreted languages are Chukis, Ilocano, and Marshallese. Um, so what makes us a little bit unique is that, you know, with, um, you know, our sister states in the mainland, uh, you know, Chukis, Ilocano, and Marshallese, are, they're not common languages that you would find um, even if you had uh, machine translation. Um, there's n not as much resources um, that you would find for Chukis or Ilocano and Marshallese. So Chukis and Marshallese, those are uh, languages spoken from um, the Copa Nations, Compact of Free, Free Association, Association. So those are uh, countries in the Pacific. Um, and that's kind of the challenge that we face out here in Hawaii. Uh, so I'm going to go over some of our current legal, legal tech tools that we have. Um, and again, these are all mostly from TIG funding. So we have our legal form helper, um, we have our legal information videos, and then we have our Hawaii Legal Services uh, portal. I know um, a few other legal aid organizations, uh, you know, the online forms, the A2J forms, it's common. Uh, for us, we have over 40, um, 40 forms now, um, you know, in all different areas of law, from housing to family to disaster relief. Um, and of course, with the issue with this is despite the number of forms that we have, we don't have any that are translated 
uh, in other languages. Um, so despite having these resources, I mean, the problem we're facing is how can we have, um, you know, how can we get usage from um, LAP communities, language English proficient communities um, in our state to use some of these resources online. Uh, with that in mind, we did apply for um, another, another grant, a TIG grant, it was to create these legal information videos. And then just knowing uh, kind of the language access issues uh, that we do have in the state, we were able to translate um, a few of these videos into Chukis, Ilocano, and Marshallese. Um, in terms of actually translating it, we we worked with the um, Hawaii State Judiciary just to get feedback from them in terms of um, <coughs> in terms of what languages that you know they that uh, they're experiencing in the courts for interpreters, what are what the most common languages that, they're, that they need interpreters for. So based on that, their feedback, we created these um, legal information videos. Um, what's great about some of these YouTube videos is that um, you, know, you can create the subtitles on the bottom uh, for people that are hearing impaired. Um, if some are in English, you, know, you, could, you could do different subtitles uh, in different languages. So this is some, we have, we have some that are translated into Chukis, uh, we have some that are in Marshallese, and we have some that are in uh, Ilocano. Um, and of course, some of the challenges uh, when doing this, uh, doing these videos, um, is just making sure that the product that we're producing um, is actually based on best practices, um, you know, in terms of uh, translations. Just switch screens. Uh, and then our final project, so we also have the legal services portal. So with this portal, you know, working together with um, Pro Bono Net and, and Law Help was just uh, to have a resource where people can go to, um, uh, can go to for the right referral and for the right um, legal resource and information, uh, brochures. And of course, the challenge that we're facing, of course, is how do we get people from the um, LFT communities to use these resources when, one, we don't have it in their language, and two, um, we're not even sure if they're able to access some of these resources. So, you know, uh, based on that, our current um, TIG project, TIG uh, funded project, um, is to basically uh, to better some of these resources, um, to make sure that, uh, you know, we do provide meaningful inclusion um, for our LFP communities. Um, you know, we can have all these great tools and resources online, but if it's not being used by our LAP uh, communities and you know I, I feel like it's really a disservice to our state and uh, to the different populations that we serve. Um. <clears throat> so one of our main goals <clears throat> is improving online accessibility uh, to legal resources for the state's growing LAP population um, and what we're, we're looking to do is working with the Hawaii State Judiciary and its office on equality and access to the courts uh, just to again to determine the best languages for translation and I think for us it's really just working with um, our community partners uh, especially our judiciary and you know our other um, community organizations just to, to get feedback and you know what are some of the issues that they're facing or when, what are some of the issues that they're seeing uh, in the LAP communities um, and we'd like to be able to translate our, our current law help website into at least three other languages um, a lot of law help sites uh, nationwide you know, they're available in, in Spanish or some of the more um, common uh, Asian languages. But for us, you know, to be able to have something in Marshallese, to be able to have something in Chukis, uh, it's just really important for our community. Um, and then just something that <clears throat> uh, I think that's novel or, or for us, uh, just a novel approach is uh, we're actually looking to do outreach and education uh, to the different LAP communities, making sure that they're aware of these resources. Um, and from our understanding with some of our staff um, you know, that are um, you know, from some of, the, some of the LAP communities, is that one of their methods of communication, you know, letting people know that you know, this resource is available or letting people know uh, where to go to for help, um, it's just it's through Facebook, through Facebook and social media. Um, Don. Uh, some of their community navigators 
uh, you know, one of our um, staff member who's who's working on this project, um, you know, there's this notion that uh, the community respects um, well-known advocates. So we're lo we're looking to launch uh, this community navigators project, and then <clears throat> based on based on their feedback, letting them know that these tools are available, and then from that uh, from that being able to uh, share the resource in the community. Um, for some of these more the island-based uh, cultures. Uh, it's really still word of mouth, um, you know, through community gatherings, through uh, churches, through uh, extended family events. Um, and right now, it really looks like uh, through social media, specifically through Facebook, that's how they get their information um, across. Um, you know, not everyone has access to a desktop, um, but everyone usually has some sort of cell phone or smartphone. Uh, you know, and from that, that's where they access. Uh, Facebook or some of the different social media platforms. Um, so actually, something coming soon is is the Legal Navigator. This is something that we're very excited about. Uh, this is a project that's uh, led together by Microsoft, the Legal Services Corporation, and uh, Pro Bono Net. Um, we also had uh, the Pew Charitable Trust that joined um, in early 2018. And what it is, it's a it's a new initiative that uh, I know some of you guys have heard it about in different conferences, but it's a web-based tool that uses clear, uh, simple language to help people understand uh, their civil legal problems um, and find the correct path forward. Um, so really the goal is just, it's, it's uh, Hawaii and Alaska were chosen to pilot uh, these online platforms, um, but we're looking to use uh, cutting edge kind of user-centered technology um, to make sure that people can access uh, uh, the civil legal help that they need and access to other resources. And I, I think for us what's exciting about it is that there is the component of language access. I think that's one of the common questions uh, we get all the time when we do, um, when we share this uh, project with the public is how are you, especially here in Hawaii, is how are, how are we going to address uh, language, language, access, <coughs> language access issues. Um, in terms of the project, it will support um, uh, machine translations. Uh, right now, the basic strategy is to support machine translation uh, for basic navigation elements, like the informational text. Um, but it's also going to allow for human-centered, uh, human-translated versions um, of the curated experience. So what's great about it is it's 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 still going to be in the beta testing. Uh, we're going to test it out. Um, hopefully, we'll have um, something to pilot uh, early 2019. Test it out in the different LAP communities. See how we can improve the tool. Um, based on their feedback. And again, it really goes back to Microsoft's inclusive design strategy when, um, you know, when they started this project. It's, it's just using the set of principles and methods that uh, they use when they produce products that are um, with, with the mindset that it should be access, accessible to all um, and learning from the different types of uh, perspectives. Um, so that's something exciting, um, and uh, especially when it comes to language access. So we hope to get this right. Um, as one of the pilot states um, with Alaska, and we'll have more to report back uh, once we go into testing phase. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Sergio. That was awesome, and we look forward to seeing more. Okay, so I don't believe there are questions for you at this point. We'll also save time at the end for questions. Um, and next up, we're going to hear from Sakao. Hi, sorry. <laughs> I was muted for a second there. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. As Miranda said, I've, I've helped found and develop the airport lawyer app that helps people with visa issues at the airport. Uh, I also help Town Widen, which is a, a new program which helps immigrants that are facing removal proceedings uh, receive paid legal counsel. And uh, professionally, my background is in uh, the business side of uh, tech startups, um, as well as being a lawyer. But uh, I'm, I'm here because of my experience with particular translation issues related to the development of the Airport Lawyer app. Uh, Airport Lawyer was developed following the announcement of the travel ban in early 2017, uh, and the response at the time involves 
uh, the legal, a huge number of lawyers and uh, the legal community in general expressing significant interest in going down to the airport and helping out. Uh, and this was great, but it created two significant problems. The first was uh, organization, which each airport dealt with differently, but they all sort of spun up their own ad hoc organization. Uh, the second problem was both more important and more challenging, uh, and that was just how to find people who needed help. Uh, all these lawyers wanted to help, but they had no way of reaching or even discovering potential clients. Uh, uh, CBP would pull someone aside and take their cell phone and secondary screening, uh, so they had no way to call out or alert anyone that might need help. And so our solution at first was very basic, which was, of course, to uh, walk around the airport and talk to anyone who looked worried uh, and looked like they'd been waiting a long time. Uh, and this was productive, and we helped a lot of people. But uh, you can see that this is not comprehensive and this anything but uh, efficient. So I ended up discussing this problem with another tech-oriented attorney, and we reached out to a, a software engineering firm, Neo Logic, uh, that had previously expressed interest in trying to help with the problem. Uh, and there we began the process of trying to build something new, uh, which, of course, meant a lot of very lengthy conversations on Slack and via email. Uh, we started with the problem, people in distress, uh, or who are worried that they might be placed in distress, have no means of contacting the ready supply of legal aid that is waiting to help them. And from there, we began stripping it down to its most essential idea. Two groups of people needed to connect. Now, what does that mean? That means there needs to be simple, because you need to account for every level of sophistication. It needs to be, uh, as Anna Steele pointed out in her presentation, uh, in plain language, uh, because it needs to be used quickly. And also, uh, plain language really helps uh, ease the process of translation. Uh, it needs to be secure enough that random people can't access it, but it can't be so secure that it takes time to build uh, because building very secure systems is time consuming and challenging for all the parties involved in the process. And so what we came up with is Airport Lawyer, which you can see on the screen. Uh, Airport Lawyer is a simple, straightforward web app that lets people enter their relevant information, have it be received by a selected coordinator at their destination. Uh, it's very simple, it's text light, it's in six languages, it's uh, secure, and it doesn't require significant user steps. It's been very successful. Uh, we worked with 20 different airports uh, and 20 different organizations. And uh, while the travel ban is no longer in place, I, I still get contacted uh, as a Seattle coordinator almost once a week by someone using this app or someone who's been referred to this app to try and get legal help uh, as they're entering the country. Uh, and there are a couple of lessons that I think we can take from our development experience and apply to uh, any anyone looking to develop new technologies that will require translation. Uh, the first uh, and most important thing that I took away from the experience was about the gathering and value of user stories uh, for something that is going to have to be translated uh, in multiple languages uh, at an early stage of development. Uh, when developing new product, especially in an emergent situation like this was in response to the travel ban, it can be easy to forget that you're not the end user and get very focused on the product you wanted to design in your head. Uh, in this case, you know, we started development, but the lawyer is not the end users of airport lawyer. It's the that scared person waiting in customs. Uh, and thinking those terms helped us to better define or refine the problem, and it helped us deal with translation issues earlier rather than later, because what we did is we reached out to a number of community leaders uh, and brought them into the discussion and started the conversation earlier about, well, what what is, what are your needs going to be? What's it going to look like? Uh, and how is how is this going to work for you? Um, so uh, you know, when we started out, we had this vision of a platform with real-time communication and a full suite of security measures. Uh, but that's really complicated. That's very slow. That's challenging for someone on an iPhone or with no Wi-Fi in the back of the airport who doesn't speak English. So one of the first things and feedback we got was a, a lot of keeping it simple. Uh, and on a language translation level, this meant that we needed to think about a lot about design and how our product would look when translated uh, across multiple languages and across multiple different language scripts. Um, you can't have a lot of tight spacing and variant text boxes when you need to bounce between English and Arabic and Urdu and Persian and a number of other languages. Uh, knowing that in advance uh, meant we also worked with the community and we listened and we learned that translation was not just a matter of simply the language, but also cultural translation. Uh, in particular, one of the key pieces of feedback that we got that I mentioned before was that 
this is something that had to work primarily on a mobile device. You can see our home, our landing page right now on the screen, uh, and that's on my desktop. But it looks exactly the same on mobile uh, and is really designed for use on that. You know, it's, a, it's got one button action items and it's very simple. Uh, and we did that because regardless of language, the feedback we got from all communities was that the people who are going to be using this, whether they're in the airport or not, are going to be using it on a phone. Uh, phones are the primary and predominant uh, means of internet access for the communities we're trying to help. So it doesn't make any sense to build something for desktop if no one's ever going to view it there. Uh, and then the other thing we also learned uh, was about the limits of information people would be comfortable sharing. So we built our product to collect the bare minimum of information in order to ensure that people uh, felt comfortable filling out the form. Uh, and these are the things that I think of not just as language translation, uh, but as uh, cultural translation um, so that it's not just going to read in their language but it's actually going to work for them uh, with their background um, and you know this kind of customization when you're working in an emergent situation can sometimes feel unnecessary it feels like you just want to get it out there but I always refer back to the idea that if the information if people can't find your information easily then that information no matter how valuable doesn't serve any purpose uh, content that can't be accessed is content that functionally doesn't exist. Um, and this is especially true when you don't know where your users are going to be accessing your product or how long you're going to be able to hold their attention. So if you don't make it easy, uh, you could lose some of the very people you're trying to help. You know, and it comes back to this idea that the people who need help are the end users of what we build. And we should always be asking whether what we build is meeting their needs, uh, not necessarily our own design goals. Uh, and as I said, this extends not just language, but cultural as well. And the second theory thing that I want to focus on with these collecting of user stories and their importance is the dramatic impact they can have on development because they begin the process of addressing issues with representation and technology and how that representation problem can slow down exactly the kind of translation efforts I'm talking about. And I think this refers back to what Sergio was talking about with community navigators and having those people already in the room was going to save you a lot of steps and really streamline your development process into building the most useful tool. Uh, and going out into the community and getting feedback and taking the care and the time to generate these user stories and use cases that inform our development um, shapes our front end. Like I said, it, you know, the front end changes if it's got to be mobile first and our back end in terms of what data we're going to collect. Uh, and this does slow development. Um, but in an emergent situation, if you think about development as all the way to actually being useful, it's worth it to seek out the information because it made our tool that much more impactful. It made it uh, something that really made a difference when we released it rather than releasing it and going through three iterations uh, before we could get into something that was useful, before we could get to something that really made a difference for people. You know, and fundamentally, most software tools are, are somewhat social justice agnostic. You know, they carry information from one party to another, and the speed and skill with which they carry that information isn't defined by the substance of the project. They're, they're just tools. And what we can do when we engage in thoughtful and community-oriented development is pick up those tools and use them to help others. And we can design the best tools to help the most number of people. Um, so that's it. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thanks so much, Tagal. That was awesome. Uh, pause to see if there's questions um, or comments. Maybe everybody is uh, digesting the wisdom. <laughs> I'll take criticism or complaints as well. I'm not seeing any questions coming in, but we can definitely, um, if, if people are typing them in, we can wait until the end as well. Okay, sounds good. And if uh, somebody can make me presenter, we'll hear from Jeezy next. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Zizi Bandera, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Immigration Advocates Network. We are a 501c3 organization that designs web-based tools 
to increase access to justice for immigrants and to strengthen the capacity of the organizations that serve them. Today, I'll be talking to you about one of these tools, which is IMI. I'll start with sharing with you a little bit about the website, what it does, and then I'll share about how we redesign the website to have more accessible language and user workflows, which we learn go hand in hand. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of background to IMI. Over 1.5 million undocumented immigrants are eligible for immigration relief without knowing it. IMI is a free online tool that helps immigrants in the U.S. understand their legal options. Users fill out an anonymous online questionnaire that takes anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes, depending on the, the answers. Then they are provided with personalized results, explaining the immigration options they may qualify for based on their answers, as well as any potential risks. Uh, next slide, please. The problem we noticed is that users were struggling to quickly access and understand the content that was relevant to them. The platform requires so many inputs from users that many were not completed in the survey, and it's difficult to find answers for specific questions by browsing the website. We also have a robust learning center, which is part of IMI with a lot of Know Your Rights information, and people were missing or not accessing it the way we wanted. Um, another big challenge was that it was not immediately clear to users that the site is credible or privacy safe, and I'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. Our design challenge was to redesign IMI to better support our user goals. We wanted to make it easier to discover personalized recommendations by streamlining user workflows and optimizing the navigation for quick access to critical content. We wanted to emphasize IMI's credibility in order to build trust and confidence among our users. Next slide, please. Come on. Uh, so how we did it. Uh, we were lucky to have the support of Google designers who were amazing and provided us with a lot of their time and expertise for this project. We organized two rounds of semi-structured exploratory interviews with our target users. And uh, yeah, like, like has been mentioned earlier, there's really no way around this if you want to ensure that your website is useful to the audience that you're targeting. We always try to step into the shoes of our users, but there's nothing like actually sitting next to them and not only observing how they naturally navigate the site, but also be able to hear about their worries, their lives, and their reality. So based on our findings, we made design changes. We then tested the changes with another round of interviews. Uh, lastly, we implemented round two findings, which I will show you shortly. Uh, we had a total of 25 participants and spent about an hour with each. The group we talked to represented a mix of age, genders, and countries. We tested both mobile and desktop, and we also had a few internal design sprints throughout this process with our Immigration Advocates Network team. Next slide, please. Our content principles were to build trust with users, set expectations for what IMI does and doesn't do, use positive human language, and avoid legal jargon or only use it when needed. Next slide, please. Come on, man. Uh, so these were some of our key findings. I'll go a little bit into each of these. Uh, we learned that we had to add information about the organization behind the site to the home page. User trust hinges on first impressions and a navigation element or the about us was not enough for our users. I mean, again, these recommendations are specifically for you know our goal and our users. We also learned that we had to reassure our users of upfront that any data they provided would be anonymous and that their data was secure. Uh, through the interviews we we did, most of our users mentioned fear of being surveilled by the government. Many expressed hesitation in even searching for resources for immigrants online because they thought it would flag them to the government. And this is not necessarily a new finding for us, but the extent to which the fear is heightened is specific to the time we're living in, um, This, which made it especially important for us to express the anonymity of our website and to communicate trust through careful use of language and design on our site. Um, we also learned that users were looking for a physical address for our office on the website, and then not having one on the website was jeopardizing trust with our users. Uh, they wanted to know that we had a physical location, whether it was close to them or not. Um, this is a challenge and continues to be a challenge for us because we don't provide direct services or anything of the sort, so we don't have a physical office address that we can necessarily publish. Um, we're still trying to find the best way to address this given our limitations, but it's a it's a good tip that we learned and wanted to share with you all. Um, we also learned that we had to modify the signage copy to be simpler and easy to understand. Um, these are some examples, you know, going from defensores legales to expertos en inmigración, which is, uh, we previously had legal advocates and we changed that to immig uh, immigration experts as an example. 
um, or you know one of our main call to actions was uh, el cuestionario, which means uh, take this quiz, and we changed that to answer these questions, um, just to make it more clear uh, call to action. And we also created a tagline, which was a fun process for our team. Um, we, from the user interviews, we learned that people were confused about our name and our logo, so we created a tagline uh, to go with it. Um, not only was it fun for us, but we also came up with something that resonated with people and was effective um, through our user test. Next slide, please. So this is our old ME design, um, our version one. So there were many things that we learned from our user interviews, including, you know, things uh, specific things to the language we were using, but also design like the the green that we had on the website. Some users um, had a hard time reading or, you know, seeing the grain um, was a little too light for them. Um, and you'll see uh, when I go to the, to the updated version, the changes that we made. Um, and you can skip to the next one. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, at the top of this one, you can see the user stories as well. Oh, if you can go back one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so at the top of this screen, you can see Eduardo, me, Alejandra, and Beatriz, and these are all um, user stories that we um, created based on uh, the different user journeys of our audience. And um, as was mentioned earlier, just the importance of people being able to connect. We get a lot of uh, user support requests um, from people that are specifically on you know, each of these stories and are sending us um, questions that are relevant to them or uh, you know, these stories are resonating with them and they're able to connect with the user story, so then they're like, oh, well, this sounds like me, or it sounds like my situation, and these are questions that I have. Um, so we also learned that that's uh, really helpful. Um, next slide, please. So these are some quotes from our users, uh, and these are translated to English. Uh, most of our the users we tested on were uh, Spanish um, monolingual speakers, or uh, first, their first language is Spanish. So. Uh, first one is having a website in my mother language is so important because legal things are hard to comprehend. I have visited websites where the translations to Spanish are so bad that they leave you even more confused than anything else. And for us, uh, we are lucky to have uh, Spanish-speaking staff on our um, on our team that are that are able to review the translations and make sure that they are accurate and sending um, you know the message that we want to our users. Um, but making sure that, that uh, not only was it accurate translation, but that the specific words weren't scaring people away was also really important. Um, second quote, all the information here reads very simple and friendly, which was our goal, and this is feedback from our, our very final um, testing with the users. And then the last, uh, this, this they're, they're referring to the tagline, makes me feel supported, like they care about me. I feel confident I will be able to understand the information because they said it's simple and I love that it's free because it's hard to spend $200 on a lawyer consultation if you don't even know if you have a case. Um, so once participants discovered the tagline, they felt they knew the site much better. Some of the adjectives that were used to describe the tagline made them feel were supported, confident, relieved, and trustworthy, which was our, our goal. So we felt that this was uh, really effective. Um, Another thing is that uh, the users, through our, the feedback that we received, they felt like the site was extremely useful to the immigrant community, especially in the current climate, since the options toward legalizing have diminished or are being threatened, and this is something they're constantly hearing on the news. Um, and people also felt the mission of ME.org was clear, clear, at least more clear than it was in our version one, and excited about the prospect of receiving information about uh, their immigration policies in their native tongue. Next slide, please. The moment we've all been waiting for. Um, here is the redesigned um, website. As you can tell, the, the green is now a darker green. Um, we included this in the news section um, or the panel that has some quotes from different pu uh, publications we've been highlighted on. and. These are, um, you know, news outlets that our users recognize, and it was also something they were looking for to see um, who basically had endorsed the website or if it was something they could trust. Um, and we stayed away. We had uh, at some point considered having um, 
different leaders or, you know, different figures um, like Jorge Ramos or, or people that are well-known in the community, but um, we thought it would be better just to have an even broader, um, for example, quote from Univision versus a specific uh, reporter since, you know, things happen sometimes and um, it, might, it might change uh, the way that these specific figures are perceived. Um, so just to keep it as safe as possible and then um, the, one of the things you can also see here is that our main headline change to path to legal immigration status. Um, in our version one, the main headline was, uh, do you qualify for a way to stay in the U.S.? And that was kind of turning our users off, which is not what we wanted to do. So, um, so yeah, we changed it and found that people were uh, receiving more receptive to this information in this way. Um, and the navigation bars are all different. Uh, the the call to action buttons are all different. Um, we also um, made sure that the the three people that you see, which are the same user journey stories that I had mentioned earlier, are still there. Um, they're a lot more uh, prominent on the website um, because we felt that people were really connecting to them and wanted to see also uh, a story of a family, which was something that we added that we didn't have previously. Um, we had individual stories, so um, that was another thing that we changed. Um, so this is most of what, uh, some of the highlights of what we learned through our redesign process, a lot was focused on, on the language and the content um, being friendly and being really careful about what messaging we were using overall and then specific to each call to action. Um, and then also the, the design overall of the, of the website. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, we were very, very lucky to have uh, the volunteers from Google helping us out with this process and sharing their expertise. If this is something that you're interested in for your website or your tools, um, you can, they have a few community grant programs that they, um, you know, you're able to connect with their designers and they're able to donate time to, to different projects. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and if you have any questions about um, the process, uh, what we learned from it or anything um, that you feel you could benefit from, feel free to reach out. And I'm sure folks will be sharing our contact information um, yeah, I'm always happy to, to share what we learned. So thank you. Thanks so much, Susie. Um, so we'll see if there's any questions from the audience. And I just want to thank uh, all the panelists today because it's been really um, a thoughtful and a helpful presentation. And I'll wait to hear if there's any questions from our audience, but uh, one question I had was how maintenance and uh, language access are handled um, in your respective projects. So it seems like with legal technology projects, uh, the work is never done, so there's, uh, you know, enhancements, bug fixes, et cetera, uh, constant review, law changes. How are those things handled with uh, multilingual content? And this is easy. For us, a lot of the feedback or the way we maintain an ear to the ground is through our user support requests that we get and we use SendF to manage those. And um, they come to me, so uh, and I'm able to see where people are sending questions from or what page of the website. So um, sometimes if there is uh, something that's not resonating with folks or I feel like it's not clear, um, depending on whether they're on Spanish or English, we will change it. Um, the website is not, a, um, I guess, a very direct translation from English to Spanish. Um, some things resonate more said differently in Spanish and, and vice versa. So um, we just take it as as we go, I guess, uh, is my answer. And if, if I could add to Miranda from um, one of the, the pointers that LSE, you know, provided, I think for us before we were kind of reactionary, you know, if we saw something needed to be changed on the website, um, you know, we would just change it. Um, you know, the flexibility was good, but I think what they had pointed out was having some sort of uh, written, um, uh, like an update plan in terms of like how many times are you going to review it for, or when you would review it um, for updates, who would update it, so that um, you know there's some sort of institutional knowledge there. Um, so that, that's something that we're working on as well.
so how is um, user testing um, really involved in the process and what what part of your budget is really part of user testing with regards to uh, translations? Um, for us, this is easy uh, with any um, for us, like I mentioned, we were very lucky to have Google support, um, and they were able to provide our users um, a, for the first round $100 gift cards for their hour, and then the second round $50 gift cards, and this was provided by Google, so um, users were very happy. And there was also, um, also important to note that, um, you know, I, we always want to be able to compensate people for their time, especially when it's, you know, people that are um, low earning or um, have trouble with uh, financially just to donate time in that way, but there were a lot of the people that were interviewing um, were really hesitant to accept the gift cards um, as well, and they just were really happy to be able to help and, and provide feedback on the website. Um, there's a question here to uh, Mr. Yam Yamamata. Um, is the airport lawyer service um, also available in Guam? Um, well, the airport lawyer service is uh, available for incoming airports. I don't know that we have uh, partners, uh, a partner legal organization in Guam. Um, if there's interest in one, we're certainly happy to uh, create access tools if, uh, if there's someone who wants to split out, but we're not a partner with an airport organization in Guam, no. Um, any other questions at this time? Uh, we, we have several comments of uh, thank you from our audience. Um, we, we greatly appreciate you putting on this uh, webinar. Um, are any other um, questions from the panelists or any final thoughts that people have? Uh, thank you. I just want to repeat it again to the panelists, and thank you for uh, listing everyone who joined the call today. Um, we encourage you to check out the next panel, and uh, I can drop my contact information into the chat box if you have any questions about today. And we encourage you to uh, share the recording of today's uh, panel with panelists with those who might be in might be interested but were unable to attend this morning or this afternoon. Great. Thank you so much to our panelists and our audience and to LSM Dep. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, ProBonoNet, for putting this together. We greatly appreciate it. Um, there will be a survey coming out um, after this. This particular uh, two-part language access was a response to the high interest last year. Um, if there are particular topics that you would like to see, please feel free to put those into the survey. Uh, that comes out and give us feedback on this. That's how we choose our future trainings. Thank you to all of the speakers. We greatly appreciate it.